And it's a pleasure to be here just today. Welcome to Lewiston. Welcome to the Bates Mill Complex. I hope you all get a chance to tour the complex later today uh, and take a look at some of the areas that are a little further along in this area in terms of renovations and improvements. Our current economy and the means future. We have some challenge though. If you look back to 1960 to 2010, population in the service center communities has been relatively flat. For the first time in some years, we saw a little bit of a bump in the 2010 census. I think that shows that maybe we're getting the idea that we have to do something different than what we've done historically. We tend to have lower uh, median family incomes than most of the rest of the state and higher poverty rates. Some of that reflects the fact that people who need services tend to congregate in service center communities because that's where the services are, be they hospitals or, or social services. We have higher tax rates, 42% higher than the rest of the state. Uh, you notice that the average of the service centers is 1445. Our tax rate is 26, is over $26. I would love to have a $14 tax rate. That certainly again impacts how service centers can compete in today's economy. The red line shows where it should be under state statute. The blue line shows where it actually is. The difference is somewhere around $4 million this year. In addition, the business equipment tax exemption this year is costing us $1.6 million. So not even counting some smaller sources of state revenue, we're down $5.6 million on about a $43 million budget, operating budget. How have we dealt with that? Number one, we've reduced our employment. We've cut employment by about 30 over a period of, from 2009, from just short of 370 to just a little bit above 330. That unfortunately also continues a trend that, that preceded these, this period of time. At one point, the city had 411 employees. We now have 330. So that seems to be, oops, push the right button. And again, one of the results is that while our tax rate was falling through the good times we had only in the 2000s, our tax rate has again begun to climb back up. I will point out that tax rate increase is probably covering only about a third of the funding that we've lost in the state. So, given that context, what can we do? What can we continue to do today? I think we can anticipate that that context will continue at least for a period of time because the economy is still sluggish and hasn't really rebounded. One of the things I'm going to take, take a second and look at this. Uh, it says the first economists. I'm going to substitute the, the older urbanists. For many, many decades, really starting in the 50s, 60s, 70s, what most municipal urban centers tried to do was to compete, compete with their suburban neighbors. We tried to build suburban housing developments. We tried to build malls. We tried to build the way people were doing in suburban America. And guess what? That really didn't work. It was awfully hard for a variety of reasons, some of which I covered today, for us to do that. So we really need to start thinking about doing things different. And I think that's one of the great things that we're seeing, you know, reasons for this conference today. We have to rethink what we're doing. So, what I would suggest you all do, even though you, you may not have the money to do everything you want, is first review where, where things stand in your community, renew the partnerships that have worked for you over time, refocus your efforts, keep doing the easy stuff, there is easy stuff that you can still do, plan for the future and target your investments. Very quickly, I'm not gonna talk about this a lot, but in terms of demographics, where, have, where are you, where have you been, where are you going, what's happening in your community, what do you want it to be? What do you, look at those old plans. You know, there are a lot of old plans sitting on shelves that have a lot of good recommendations in them. One of the things we've been doing in Lewiston is going back through them, summarizing the recommendations, seeing where we are so that we know where we are on these plans and what we still have to do and what we might be able to do as we go forward. Review your fiscal capacity. Capacity to borrow. Now is a great time to borrow and to invest. Interest rates have never been lower. Take advantage of it if you can. Not everyone can do that. So Communities have much higher debt than others, but if you have to borrow money and do stuff. Renewing partnerships, just real quickly, a couple of them in Lewiston. Obviously, you're in the Batesville complex. This is part of it. Tom Platts is one of the main developers, but there are other people involved. Staying in touch with them. 
On the right-hand side, part of that building has been turned into uh, housing by uh, Nathan Zanton, so keeping in touch with people that you've worked with in the past so that when they're ready to do something, you're still in contact with them. That's a building downtown that's now a fuel restaurant and has been completely redeveloped by a local developer. Staying in touch with him, he's also done that building on the right-hand side there the, with the yellow brick. He's, he's done work on that one, so staying in touch with those folks. Your arts community can become an important attraction because one of the things we need to stop doing is chasing businesses and start chasing people. We need to attract people to our communities. Arts and culture can do that. Social service agencies, farmers markets, things like this. This is uh, St. Mary's Nutrition Center, one of their farmers markets that they run in town. That again is something that can attract people that people really like. It's a really growing trend. Community groups that are raising money. Uh, do the 50-50 thing, we need to repair the gazebo, but that's coming out of a community group that's putting that up together. So was lighting uh, Lewiston City Hall, the tower. Uh, that, that's an effort by an ex-mayor putting together a group of people. He'd like to see all of the buildings in downtown with some interesting lighting. We have a neighborhood group that's working on a park in a neighborhood, and a park can be, again, an attraction to that neighborhood, can bring people together, can build community. So working with those groups, not trying to dissuade them, encouraging them, planning for the future. We've done a Riverfront Island Master Plan. You're, this is the area we're looking at right now, right in the heart of the city, urban infill, urban redevelopment, mill redevelopment, all those things play a part of it. We have 1.8 million square feet, feet of mill space, so if any of you want to, are looking for space, we've got some, come see us, Link's here somewhere. This way. There's Link, he's over there at Sea Lake. He can show you all the space you might ever want. But you have to do planning in a certain way. You have to get people involved. One of the things that we've done on all of our plans recently is really put a lot of effort on outreach and involvement. This is just an example of some of the things we've done. Public meetings, walk-arounds, um, open houses where people can come and just talk to people off uh, formal meetings. Again, more examples of some of the public outreach that was done. That's part of the plan, the notion of mixed income, mixed fill, infill development, mixed use development along one of our canals with the canals redeveloped and reused so that they become an attraction that, they, that people can, 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 that can bring people to the area. We also recently done our comp plan. Comp plans can be done without spending too much money. Uh, one of the fun things we did, I think that may be Dave Hediger, who's our planner, that's his back. A lot of the staff people wore t-shirts. Uh, for the event to try to get attention for it. Again, involve people, get people around maps, get them saying what they want to see, get them say, saying what they like, what they don't like about the community. That's an example of one working group. We had our consultants set up an office on Lisbon Street and spent four days there where anybody could walk in and talk to them and make suggestions and recommendations. Here they are looking at, uh, at the maps that were produced in the initial session. This is in there for Kara, it's one of Kara's favorite things. We did a little urban infill project where we took a parking space and made it into a park. People were eating there, it's right in front of the office where the consultants were, it added a little bit of fun to the process. We had some members of our planning board who were, thought we were not taking things seriously enough, but it was one of the best things we did to get attention for our efforts. So have fun when you do these kinds of things. But really, what, what I found in the last two planning processes we've gone through, it wasn't the planners planning. It was the planners listening to people, listening to the community, getting their input, almost becoming scribes, then taking everything that they've heard and running it back through their planning backgrounds, their history, their knowledge, their experience, and producing it and sending it back to the community for its reaction. So instead of comprehensive planning where you have four meetings over two years, where nobody's paying attention by the time you're done, Reverse the process, get all the input at the front end, use that as the basis for your planning process. Doing easy stuff. Paint's cheap. You can put bike lanes in where you have the capacity to do it without spending much money. When you do a reconstruction project, this is down at Wal Walnut Street in downtown, instead of just reconstructing the street, do curb butt bump outs, add esplanades, put trees in, do those kinds of things. It adds only a little to the cost of a project you're already doing. When you have a local developer, this is a building in downtown that's been redone by Argo Marketing, vacant for many years. 
That project was basically uh, Argo Marketing's it, their impetus. They needed a little bit of help from us with a couple of grants for facades and things like that. Very small contribution, a small tip, gets you a big result. The building actually looks a little bit different than this when it was finally done, but it's now completely redone and back in service. So if you do those kinds of things, even in tough times, guess what? The sun will rise again. <laughs> and this is a, a sunrise over downtown Lewiston, that's uh, Lewiston City Hall there. So even in tough times, you can do things. And I think one of the things I'd urge you to do today is to listen and learn and pick up those things you can do both today and put in your bucket list things you can do in the future as things improve and as we get better financial resources. So have a great day. Thank you very much. Jonathan, back to you.